I've already said what I think about minimum standard for healthy living. Social protection policies make a difference. Government policy really matters. Next slide, please. Again, David Suckler calculated if there were no social protection policies in place, a 3% rise in unemployment would be associated with about a 3% rise in suicide. In Eastern Europe, the level of social protection is about $37 per head. And that's active labour market programs, family support, health care and unemployment benefits. With that level of social protection, a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with about a 2.5% rise in suicide. In Western European countries, on average, we spend about $150 a head on social protection. And that means a 3% rise in, suicide, in unemployment is associated with less than a 1% rise in suicide. Government spend expenditure on social protection mitigates the effect of unemployment on suicide. Wow! Government policy really makes a difference. Spend the money to improve people's lives, and it works. That's what the evidence shows. And looking at all-cause mortality, social spending per capita, the greater the social spending, the lower the all-cause mortality for 18 EU countries. Countries to the east, the newer member states that spend less, have higher all-cause mortality. And in fact, one of the ideas that's been put to us as we do the European review of social determinants and the health divide is that one of the good effects of the European Union is that the former communist countries, in order to pre prepare for membership of the European Union, had to put in place European-style social protection policies. They haven't got there yet. They spend a good deal less, but they're getting there, and it's potentially improving things, improving health and well-being, which we can measure by looking at health, uh, life expectancy or mortality. I like it in French. Not inevitable and not immutable. From the beginning, when I've linked position on the social hierarchy to health, people have said to me, but there will always be social hierarchies. There will always be social and economic inequalities. If health follows the social gradient, won't there always be social gradients in health? And the answer is, yeah, probably. But the magnitude of that gradient varies over time within a country, it varies by region within a country, and it varies between countries. And the evidence suggests, like the evidence I've been showing you on social protection, that there's much that we can do about it. We do not have to accept it as inevitable or and you, and you, and you, in you are, yeah. excuse me, <laughs> embarrassment. Uh, but we don't have to accept it as a given. Um, and we can see it in operation. I won't go into it. But I do want to show you this. I fulfilled a lifetime ambition, had my photo taken with a fire chief in front of a fire engine. Um, it, one step further, I would have been sitting at the wheel of the fire engine, just for every five-year-old who wants to be a firefighter. Um, all right. Why am I showing you this? Well, I skipped over a couple of slides. When we were doing the English review, it was very important, I thought, as with the Global Commission, to make partnerships with 
areas, groups, people who were going to take action. And we partnered with the northwest region of England, Liverpool, the English city of Liverpool. And on one of my trips to Liverpool, I was taken to the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service. And the fire chief told me this nice story. He said we would go to fight a fire, we're all white males, macho hero types, and we'd go to fight a fire, and we'd come back and somebody would have died in the fire, and we'd say, that was so unnecessary. They should have done something about preventing that. And he said, then we thought, we should have done something about preventing that. Not they, we. He said, we spend 6% of our time fighting fires. The other 94% polishing our boots or whatever we do. Um, so everybody likes firefighters. So they went into people's houses and talked to them about fitting smoke alarms. And people would say, but the roof's leaking. And they'd say, you know, you can get a grant from the local authority to help you fix your roof. And people would say, that sounds a bit complicated. I wouldn't know how to do that. They became the firemen, became social workers. They'd help them negotiate a grant from the local authority. And then they said to me, do you know who dies in fires? Smokers, alcoholics, uneducated. They went through a checklist of the social determinants of predictors of ill health. So they tried to get people not to smoke in bed. And then they said, well, while we're up, why don't we try and get people not to smoke? So the firefighters are involved in trying to get people not to smoke. Then they issued pensioners with electronic cards to give them access to the gym in the fire station so could, people could go and use the gym. They brought the kids in from the local neighbourhood and got them growing vegetables. Then they teamed up with Liverpool Football Club. The firefighters teamed up with Liverpool Football Club to get kids off the street playing football. So I showed this to the general practitioners in England and said, if the firefighters can do it, you can. Surely you care about health more than the firefighters and they're out there addressing the social determinants of health right on the front line. The firefighters love me. They, they come down to London with their uniforms to have photos taken with me because I talk about the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service. So when I go to Liverpool, I get chauffeur driven round in a same Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service you know, by a fireman in a uniform. It's great. My message is really a very simple one. We are involved in an intensely ethical concern. We are trying to get a more just society. And if we achieve that, we'll know we've done it because we would have improved health and reduced the magnitude of avoidable health inequalities. But as I said, the evidence really matters.